I call to order the um, our opening of the election board meeting for July 6, 2023. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Judith Benkert. I was appointed by uh, the Monroe County Republican chairman to replace um, Donovan Garlitz, who had uh, submitted his resignation. I was subsequently sworn in by our illustrious clerk, uh, Brown, and am here today to uh, get things started. Um, I'd like to call the roll. Um, here is, uh, I guess I'll call the names and say that you're present. David Henry. Here. Clerk Nicole Brown. Here. Myself, Judith Benkert, here. And also here is Molly Turner King, who is the um, attorney uh, for the board, uh, who also works for the Monroe County Legal Department. Um, before, before we get into any major business, we do have on our agenda uh, an amending resolution for the board chairman calendar. Um, it is, I believe that's your proposal. Yep. Uh, David, would you like to address yeah, that? Sure, thanks, Judith. Appreciate it. So um, the uh, proposal is to amend our uh, policy that we adopted in 2017 on the rotation of the chair of the or the president of the board uh, to move the um, the Democratic presidency up six months to starting today, uh, really just to give you a chance to warm up. Uh, as we're already in, in 90 days out from the uh, early voting in October, we have a lot on our plate. Um, I, I wanted to maybe extend the option to uh, have an opportunity to, to uh, have some thought leadership uh, to get us through this uh, election cycle, and then we'll revisit the calendar in January to reset. Um, so that was the, the spirit of the proposal, um, and to go ahead and move the Democratic presidency up six months that would have begun on January 1st. Okay. Do we have any discussion? I have no discussion. There is a precedent on from both parties for that to happen when a new member comes on. And uh, just like, as Chairman Henry said, to um, make sure that they have a chance to kind of to ease into the water and not just jump, in, jump right in. And so uh, first, um, I also want to say welcome. Well, thank you very much. Welcome so much. I was not here when uh, Board Member Garland uh, left. Um, we will certainly miss the contributions that he made to the Monroe County Election Board and wish him well going forward. But we welcome you and we know that you will do an amazing job. Um, I got to see you on a number of occasions in your previous job. Um, you were very kind to the clerk's office and always willing to work with my office. And so it's lovely to see you today. If you would like a motion, for the proposal, I am happy to submit one unless there's further discussion. I have no uh, comments to make. You can go ahead and make a proposal. Okay. Then I will make the motion that we amend the resolution for the board president calendar that was adopted on April 6, 2017, which would then allow um, board member Henry to serve as chair six months early. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, is somebody going to call the roll? Aye. Yes. Board member Bankart? Yes, we already did this. We, we, I called the roll. I'm oh, sorry, so she's that's calling the roll for the vote. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. See, all the more reason this should be happening. Yes. President, Mr. Henry? Yes. <laughs> Motion passes. Okay. okay, I'm not gonna uh, switch chairs today. We'll do it next time. All right, okay. for sure? Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Did you put a time limit on the, your, your taking that position? Yeah, if, 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 the, if, moving, if, if we move the count, I guess that's a good point of clarification. Uh, per uh, Clerk Brown's um, motion, it's, it's moving it up six months. So six it, months? so it'd be, it, so unless we revisit it, right, it would be, um, Thank starting you. June 1st, 24, with the, with the rotation, unless we revisit the policy. January 1st. January. So you're moving yes, that's right. Yeah. Now, and then you yeah. would go through 2024. Thanks. Correct. I didn't that's say that on a live mic. Yeah, so he was effective now, and then he would have been on there for 2024 as chair. So he will just run right. through 20, the end of 2024. 
when it would revert back to the Republican chair. Okay. So give me the dates exactly. From today until December 31st at 1159, 2024. Thank you. Okay. Since I, I take that as effective immediately, so I, you mind if I just uh, take the wheel? I all right. expect you to do <laughs> all that. All right, Judith, right thanks. Ahead. All right, uh, the next motion is to, uh, the next uh, agenda item is the approval of minutes from the June 1st, 2023 meeting. My understanding is that there are not minutes available. Is that right? So we will strike that item for today. Is there an estimate on that we'll have them for next meeting? I'm not sure who is gonna be, at this point, we're not sure who's gonna be doing the minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll have right. to get back with you on that. All right, and then uh, Ms. Turner King, is there an obligation to uh, at least vote on a memorandum that we had the meeting or is that is that required? The open door law requires that, it doesn't require minutes verbatim. It does require a memorandum for each meeting that includes um, who was present, date and time, and recording roll call votes. Do we what have? What the open door law requires is that that memorandum be available in a reasonable amount of time after each meeting, but it doesn't define what a reasonable amount of time is. And I don't think there is a memorandum currently prepared for to, uh, the June 1st meeting. All right. Thank you for that. So, no memorandum, no minutes, but we will hopefully have those to review and vote on next meeting. Fingers crossed. Okay. Um, on to new business uh, updates. Clerk Brown and um, and Tree Martin. Uh, Clerk Brown. Well, um, last week I attended the annual clerks conference. Uh, that is a conference held once each year in Indianapolis, Indiana. I believe 88 of the 92 counties were represented by the clerk or their designee. Um, and there were several legislative updates that I thought you might be interested in. Um, in addition to serving as vice president of the Clerks Association this year, I also um, have continued to serve in my role as chair of the legislative committee for the Clerks Association and the Association of Indiana County. So it's very nice for me in that I'm kind of on top of what's going through the state house and being passed. Uh, this year, we played more defense than we did offense. So we kept some bad bills from ever coming to light. And we got a couple of things that might be of interest to you. So I'm looking at the um, training materials that were provided by both Brad King and Angie Nussmeyer of the Indiana Election Division. One of the bills that um, came uh, requires new ID requirements for absentee voting. Um, this was a bill that was not an ask by the clerks, but I did testify on that bill because there were a number of provisions that would have made the clerk's role more difficult. So we pushed back on that bill to get some language that compromises. So I'm gonna read to you directly from Brad King's um, training memo. Voters must provide an Indiana driver's license number, an Indiana identification number, a unique ID number in statewide voter, statewide voter registration system, or the last four digit numbers on an application for absentee voting. Just as an aside, that has never, it, it was a compromise that you could do either or. You could put your last four digits of your social or your last four digits of your ID. Um, this has been a point of contention because many of our elderly voters are not used to that when they apply, when they send their application in. Um, but there are some legislators that wanted absentee voting by mail to line up with absentee voting in person. And of course, when you show up early to vote in person, you have to bring a photographic ID, such as your passport or your license. Um, for mail application, the voter may provide a copy of their valid Indiana driver's license or their ID card or other proof of ID as permitted by the photo ID law. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the new ID information on absentee does not apply to in-person 
voting in counties that use electronic poll books. I feel fairly confident that most, if not all, Indiana counties are now on electronic poll books. There may be a very couple of counties with a very small population that still use the paper poll books, but overall, we have switched over to electronic poll books. Um, the ABS cure, and by ABS, I mean absentee. ABS cure process, if an absentee mail application does not have all of the required information to receive an absentee ballot, and it is received by the county more than 12 days before the election, the county must send the voter a notice and provide the voter an opportunity to cure the issue using a form prescribed by the election division. I wanna reassure Monroe County voters, we were already contacting our voters and making sure that they knew that their application was not complete and giving them that chance to the extent that previous incarnations of the election board, we each would take some and we would go and deliver them personally if it was within that window of time where they wouldn't have a chance to get it back in time. We would just divvy it up, drive to those homes, knock on the door, let them know what was going on. But we, we already were doing this, but it is just now um, a statute from the Indiana Election Division. If a defective absentee mail application is received less than 12 days before an election and before noon on election day, the county must send the voter an absentee, absentee application and a notice explaining the necessary requirements to vote by absentee ballots and must provide the voter an opportunity to cure the issue using a form that is prescribed by the election division. If the application is late, the notice must include a statement that the application was late. And finally on that, the law does not address what to do if that defective application comes in on day 12. Does that make sense? We've got a rule before more than 12 days, we've got a rule for less than 12 days, but if it's actually on the 12th day, I think there is some flexibility for us to just do right by the Monroe County voter, which is always the side that we err on. That was from Brad King's presentation. From Angie Nussmeyer's presentation, I thought you would be interested that the filing period has changed for school board candidates. It moves the filing period up to 14 days after the primary election through noon, 30 days after the primary filing period ends. The deadline to withdraw for any reason is noon on July 15th. The challenge deadline in 74 days before the November election. A decision on the validity of the challenge must be made 60 days before the November election. And this does not impact the filing period for write-in school board candidates. Um, also, I know because of being at the conference that this is what I'm about to tell you is going to be amended in some way, we just don't know how, but let me tell you and then let me explain. So it now says that it now requires that candidates for the same office be arranged on the same page or screen of the ballot. Does that make sense? So if there were five people running for dog catcher, they all have to be on the same page. You can't turn it over and have three on page one, turn it over and two on the other. All five have to be on the same page. The discussion that happened though, with respect to the fact that I know there's likely an amendment coming through the next session is when you're talking about delegates and you're talking about a really large county. So think about Marion County and if they had a hundred delegates, you're not likely to get all 100 names on the same ballot and so there, you know, many times when there's a larger county, um, there are exceptions to the rules. So Lake County, Vandenberg County, Marion County, there can be times where there are amendments to those rules. Um, and I, it's not out of the question that it could happen in Monroe, but to the extent that we can, we will make sure that every name for that office is on the same page of the ballot. And that's mm -hmm. ballot layout. We would have to work with our vendor to 
figure it out. So that is that one. Oh, and then two more things actually. Uh, poll workers running for a party office, a Democrat or Republican candidate that is opposed for delegate or pre precinct chairman, precinct committeeman, and their relatives may be a poll worker if the county election board, that's us, adopts a unanimous resolution. Um, this assumes that the, poll, the person meets other qualifications to serve as a poll worker and the resolution would expire on December 31st in the year that it was adopted. Um, many entities are starting to recognize that clerks and counties are having difficulty recruiting, retaining quality poll workers. And so some of the um, constraints are being relaxed so that we can allow um, more people to serve as poll workers. And of course, it's always a good time to plug the fact that we need our quality poll workers. We want you to come back. Thank you so much for all you do. And the only other thing, um, we have always adopted a resolution that allowed us to start counting um, the early and absentee ballots at 6.01 on election day. That's always just been up to the local county election board, but it is now the Indiana Election Division has said you will start counting at 601 on election day. So it's not just a resolution anymore. It's everybody in the state can start. You don't, you don't give out the results. I want to make clear you just start counting. You leave it in the hopper until it's time. Go ahead. 6.01 a.m. Six. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 6.01 a.m. We've always done that and made it so that it was our option to start and that gets us ahead. And we do not release those totals until 6.01 p.m. We never release totals prior to that, but you can start. And that the Secretary of State would like to start receiving updates as early as eight o'clock. You know how busy we are on election day from the time the polls close and the inspectors are coming back. This allows us to get a little bit ahead of schedule so that as we start getting those totals in, we can get them to the Secretary of State sooner. And of course, our candidates and campaigns are awaiting those results. So there was a lot. It's not just elections when we go to that conference, but these are the things that I thought that you might know want to know about. Do you have any questions for me? I do not. Okay. Uh, neither do I, but thanks. That was comprehensive, and um, I really appreciate that update, Clerk Brown. Um, Tree uh, Martin, is there uh, any? Are there any updates from um, election supervision you have? Oops, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll try again. Uh, Tree, do you have any updates from election supervision uh, that we need to raise at this point that are not in the agenda? Well, right now we are waiting for the state to give the okay and the verbiage to the school board, you know, Monroe, Monroe County School Corporation. The deadline for that is August 1st. So we are still in a holding pattern here. I'm sure it will be given. Okay. Um, if that concludes updates, we'll move to the general election 2023 polling locations. Um, and the first item being the preparation for countywide polling locations for the MCCSC referendum. There's a comment on that. I have given you a list of potential polling sites. It will look something like this. Right. And this is set up in the belief at this moment that the Ellettsville will not be having an election. That could change. You know, they still have a deadline that they can meet. But as it stands right now, there's 26 polling sites that would service 76 precincts. And at the bottom of that page, you'll see where there's a little bit of a breakout, like Richland 9 is in the city of Bloomington. It would get a city of Bloomington ballot, but it would not have the question on it because they're in Richland Bean Blossom School Corporation. Uh, Van Buren 2 would get a question and a city ballot, 
but the rest of the Van Burens would only get the question. Now, do you have any questions? I do not, I, and I think, yeah, as you had mentioned, we're waiting on the Ellettsville Town Council and um, for, for whether or not they're, they're going to pursue a, a, uh, a polling locations. I mean, I, I will speak at least from a party perspective. You know, there are obviously no Democratic candidates in Ellettsville that have filed or, or were, were uh, caucused. Um, so I presume that that ballot is set unless, is that what we're hearing? If no one throws in their hat in Ellettsville um, from a different party, then there'll be no need for an election. When would we need to adopt these locations or the addition um, of these locations? I would locations? probably ask you to wait until Can we put it out there that says like if I would get the question back from the state, the school board, then we could make Okay. A hard firm answer, but until I get that question back, and even though we know it's going to happen, I, I'd kind of like to have it in my hand. Okay. So if you would make this decision possibly next month, okay. August. So we have a dependency waiting from the state and we can take action on it when we have the feedback. Okay. Um, I, that's all my questions. Thanks. Yes. Um, so the meeting on August 3rd would be perfectly acceptable in terms of Hold on. When is the I think that I'm, I don't quote me on this. I'm not positive. I've got a lot of dates in my head, but I think that the last deadline falls in July for the ballot for the Republican Democratic to throw in. I'm not positive. So if that were the case, then it, we would be safe in stipulating which poll sites would be used for the tw November election. And as it stands right now, these would be those. So other questions on the preparation? I have no questions. Okay, uh, great. Thank you, Tree. Moving on, um, we, we started talking about it already, but the Ellisville general election polling locations, is there a specific update on that? I know we kind of just talked around it a little bit, but well, right now, the only polling site we have in Ellettsville is the Ellettsville Christian Church. Mm -hmm. And that would cover Richland 1, Richland 2, Richland 8, and Bean Blossom 3. And that could be scratched if, if be they scratched. won't hold right. Got it. That is correct. Okay, but we've identified the location in the event we need it. We may not need that one because those those are all the potential city of Ellettsville ballot. Okay. Questions on that line item? No, sir. Okay. All right. Great. Um, moving on, uh, the uh, section C of new business is the discussion on the establishment of a vote center study committee. Um, I will go ahead and open up discussion on this as it was an item that I had asked to be added. Uh, the, this board in a previous iteration in 2011 had considered the idea of opening up our uh, vote system in our county to vote, having vote centers where a uh, member of the public who is registered to vote could vote at any of those locations in the county regardless of precinct uh, for the purposes of uh, counting in, uh, their ballot in the election. Um, there are some good cost benefit to that activity. Um, and since 2011 when the board last considered it, um, we, we now have two thirds of the counties in the state of Indiana, uh, 60 of them, that have adopted this mode of conducting ballot um, through vote centers. Um, that includes, of course, the unanimous consent of all 60 of those counties' election boards, the, both parties, and the respective clerks in those counties that sit on those boards. And so I, I think given what we even just heard from Clerk Brown from the, the clerks' conference um, about the challenge we're facing about getting um, good uh, election day workers. Uh, every cycle it goes by where it's getting harder and harder to find those workers that um, are willing to do the effort uh, despite months of recruiting by both parties, um, that it's worth revisiting. And uh, secondly, I guess as uh, the word got out that we were going to be discussing it, I, I was encouraged by the vote of the county commissioners 
and the support of county councilors on the matter. However, um, our work is to make sure it's a bipartisan decision and not just one that is a, a, a partisan one from elected officials, but in fact, a bipartisan one. And so um, I wanted to at least raise the idea of uh, setting up a vote center study committee uh, 12 years after we tried uh, in the past and to see if we could um, do this in a bipartisan way that uh, reflects the concerns and questions of all parties, including uh, independents and libertarians in our community, uh, to see if this is a viable option and join the 60 other counties in the state that already do this. So that was the initial idea here, and I'm kind of curious, at least from the other members of the board, initial thoughts or concerns or questions about the pursuit of that um, uh, effort again. Thank you, sir. Um, just for the purposes of initiating discussions, <laughs> when I hear the word study committee, and I, I, I won't discount the validity, I feel as though it's kind of a way to kick the can down the road. So I, I guess I would want to know, did you have thoughts as far as uh, parameters? How long are we gonna study this? Because you don't want whomever the next clerk is in 11 years to say, I remember when they studied back in 2023. Yeah. Um, do you have a time limit? Do you have uh, suggestions on who would serve on this sure. committee? I don't um, mean names, I, just I, maybe. Yeah, and I think, I think today is the initial conversation. Okay. Uh, I, I think we would have to pass a, 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 a statement or a policy statement that says what those parameters would be. And, that's, and we need to have that discussion in a public space. So uh, happy to do it. Um, what we know from the Secretary of State's office, uh, and, and it's really the past three Secretaries of State that have had this as a uh, publicly available process on the state's website, is that the use of a study committee or group of people that figure out how it would work in their county is really the third step in, in their their seven step process that they've outlined, right? The first step being, you know, does your executive legislative body and the commissioners agree? You know, does your county council agree? And, and we, we have that at least by resolution from the county commissioners and, and discussion with county council. So we're already kind of in that third step in the seven step process that the Secretary of State's office has outlined. Now, the, 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 you're right, the style of the thing is, it could be a concern. So yeah, I do believe, first of all, um, whatever we would vote on should have a, a bit of a constraint that there's a product due out from that body at a certain point, uh, a report, a, uh, a findings that can be voted on and considered. So yeah, I don't think this goes on for years. This is something that uh, needs a certain amount of time to get done. Um, the secondly, in terms of its composition, um, I wasn't living in the area the last time we did this. I know, um, I, I believe some folks in the room may have been on staff the last time we investigated this. Mm -hmm as a county, but uh, there were some serious concerns from our community about the bipartisan makeup of who was deciding this. And um, I would offer that whatever we come up with should very much match the uh, way that we do redistricting in the county, where you'd have two members of each party seated, uh, nominated by the respective chairs, uh, appointed by the clerk uh, at minimum. I think that we should have some independent voices on that body. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in honoring the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the really the legacy of Randy Paul on these issues and making sure maybe there's even a libertarian voice at that table too, and a green mm. voice, right? So I, I think we need to make sure we have a good balanced bipartisan discussion. I, I mean, it should be equal representation from the, the parties that have an interest. Um, those are some broad outlines. Uh, so I, if, we, if I were to say like next meeting, we'd bring forward the, the motions that would give the, uh, duration, the mandate, the charter, what it's investigating, who the composition of the thing that we'd vote on that and, and move forward from there. Does that make sense, Clerk Brown? That does make sense. And the only other thing, um, just in terms of getting this ball going forward, um, I've made no secret of the fact that I would be in favor of vote centers in Monroe County. That continues to be the case. Of course, that is the only decision where um, the election board actually has to be unanimous. But I also, and I'm only speaking for myself as the current clerk of Monroe County, I also get nervous when people talk about cost savings. Um, there can be some cost savings, but for example, um, I can recall that previous election board and party chairs were concerned that we would be disenfranchising 
uh, voters if we went to vote centers because in some counties they reduce the number of polling sites. That is not what I am comfortable with here in Monroe County. And in fact, I'm more likely um, to go with the Marion County model where when Myla Eldridge was clerk, she did not reduce the number of polling sites. She just made every polling site a vote center. So I believe they have like more than 600 polling sites in Marion County, all 600 were vote centers. So, that, so it's not, I don't want to um, leave the impression that, oh my gosh, you know, we could run an election on $2. That is, that is never going to be true. Um, and I actually, especially because I know there have been some discussions about not disenfranchising our rural Monroe County voters, I would want to increase the number. So if we had 34 polling sites now, I'm actually open to increasing it to 40 and just making all of them vote centers. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the, the vision. I think that these are, this is all good fodder for the a study committee to study uh, and, and to determine out of the data and what really makes sense for our county uh, makes sense. I mean, we, while yeah, there are 60 counties that have moved forward on this, uh, there are going to be unique Monroe County uh, circumstances uh, that we have to consider. Um, and I, and I, I think that group should be thinking about things like ADA compliance, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, uh, what facilities make sense for, well, yeah, cost benefit, but also inc inclusive activities. But th those, those are things that are not going to be figured out in a month. Um, yeah, this is going to take a very deliberate group of people um, with the same, we're really the same deliberation in the manner in which we do redistricting to, to think through all of it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think the basic is, basics is just getting the group moving to start to do the work to answer those questions that we would have. Um, and that makes sense to me. Mr. Chair, may I ask a Sure, Molly, thank you. Yeah, Sorry. Mr. Um, King, thank you. Yeah. So myself and other attorneys in county legal read the exact same timeline or process on the Secretary of State a website that I think you referenced. Um, it's somewhat misleading because it lists step one as gauge interest and has the commissioners and council passing a resolution approving the vote center, um, the county for a vote center. Uh, however, when I checked with Indiana election division staff attorney, he had the attorney advised that that does not have to be the first step and that in some counties, the executive bodies have waited to pass the resolution until they have seen the vote plan. Where we are right now is the commissioners have passed a resolution and the county council has not. They have expressed um, interest in vote centers. Um, I know they have sent me with a list of questions and I can, we can address those today. We can wait and see the, and address them with the steering committee, whatever the board feels is most appropriate. But, um, that's what I wanted to clarify. Those resolutions don't have to be the first step, which I don't know is exactly clear on the website. Thank you, I appreciate that clarification or interpretation of that activity. I mean, it, it seems like regardless of whether we had resolutions or, or not, this, this, the study of the thing is the next um, substantive step in our county to figure out viability and, um, and engage interest uh, where stakeholders could come and be at a public comment in that meeting and, and, and provide insights that perhaps our six or five or six or seven person personnel are, are not seeing and, and making sure that for me, every blind spot is, is addressed before we really um, go down this path. I read the notes from the minutes in the past and some of the discussion, and it just strikes me, that, and I don't mean to speak ill of our predecessors, that somehow we got ahead of different parties' interests without really answering questions. And, and we started in a place of general concurrence that this is something we want to do and ended up somewhere else in a hurry based on just not really accepting that stakeholders are stakeholders, whether you think they are or not. <laughs> and that is really, in my mind, what this new body would have to really think through. So I, I think this is a really good discussion. Uh, Judith, I don't mean to cut you off, but if you have comment or concern or question on it at this point. I don't really have any concerns at this point other than I am um, happy that what you're talking about 
is to try to look at all aspects of this before anything is decided. Um, I think the makeup of the study committee will be very important. And I don't know how you want to go about trying to determine that. How do we want to do that? Do we want to come back um, for a work session? Do we want to come back? You know, how fast do we mm -hmm. want to try to put these, this thing together? Well, and I'll take a stab at that answer. I think, I think that it's, it's fine to enable that we are going to establish a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can take a subsequent meeting to work through its structure and its goals and function and outputs. Uh, I don't think we have to do that today. Um, but in terms of timing, um, this is one of those scenarios where we have to, if we're going to initiate, we have to rip the Band-Aid and do it because the calendar, as we know, is unrelenting. We have an election in November. We're going to have a primary in May. We're going to have a presidential election in November. And so it, there, there's no good time to start and, and stop the activity. It just has to initiate. And so with that comment, though, um, and I would go back to staff on this, um, the current staffing at election board is um, in progress. We do have a election where hosting in 90 days on behalf of the county. Uh, what, is your risk, what is your risk tolerance for added work and research on this question if we were to go down the path of investigating both centers this summer or? I would rather do this after the presidential because we have that time frame in 2025 that nothing is required of us except updating information and, and, and cleaning up our databases. So as far as time, and I would hate to do this, I would hate to say that we're gonna have a vote centers and go into the presidential and then find out that we have quirks that we needed to have worked out beforehand. So a smaller election would give us time to work out those quirks. Okay, uh, and there's of course nothing that says we have to, it, it, let's say if the board unanimously votes on that, yeah, there's nothing that says it has to be the next election coming, the, the transition occurs, right? These are some questions that a study committee could wrestle with long term. And Molly, I'm sorry, Ms. Turner King, did you have an insight? Well, what we can do on our end before is we can get some numbers together for you, like mm -hmm. the polling sites that we currently have, uh, the cost of the polling sites, the cost of if we would have to buy new equipment. And I don't mean new equipment, I mean we would need to do supplemental equipment. So we could get, uh, get a report to you like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've been reviewing several counties vote plan or vote center plans and um, the process on how they got to those plans. And it seems that most counties on average have taken 12 to 18 months to develop their plan. And the steering committee helps or other counties have used the steering committees to help gather the data that they need for that vote center plan. Um, so I just wanted you to be aware of that timeline. The other thing um, I wanted to add to for your discussion or consideration as is in regards to the composition of the committee. Other counties also included um, a commissioner or a council member, which may be beneficial because as I mentioned, the council itself has a lot of questions. Um, and I'm happy to help draft any document that the election board would want to help form or get a steering committee up and running. Other questions or discussion points? So I'm comfortable today making a motion that we will um, establish a study committee, but we will, we will take subsequent motions on its composition at the next meeting of the election board. Um, and so let me just restate that formally, that that's the motion I'm making. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I will motion that the uh, Monroe County Board of Elections will establish a vote setter study committee its composition, uh, duration, and uh, charter uh, will be determined by a separate resolution at the next meeting of this board. I will second that motion. Okay. Uh, can we call the roll, please, on the vote? Yeah. Clerk Brown? Yes. Board Member Beckhart? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Turner King will be working on some details <laughs> for consideration next month, but thank you, um, board. Um, 
We will now move to, well, actually, let me ask at this point, was there, were there any um, business items that had come to the attention of the uh, election office um, after the, the publishing of our uh, agenda for public uh, consideration that need to be raised uh, due to the election or the calendar? Yes, sir. Uh, which, which are those? Um, the I'm sure that it is, I saw it in the B Square Beacon, shout out to the B Square Beacon, <laughs> about the gentleman that did not, the candidate that did not uh, secure enough signatures um, to run for office and his intent to file a challenge. And so if I, is it too late to move that we add this piece of business because I believe it's something we're going to need to meet and take action on quickly if we want to invite him to meet with us prior to the deadline. Uh, well, without any objection, I, I would like to discuss the filing of the CAN-1 form by uh, Joseph Davis, uh, who is a, 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 uh, seeking uh, a, a candidacy for the Office of Mayor of Bloomington. Is there objection to discuss that at this point today? No, sir. No. All right, hearing none. Um, so, uh, so uh, uh, Clerk Brown, I know you, you just gave a bit of a, a summation here, but uh, does staff have a summary of what what Mr. Davis's um, challenge or what the what the the issues are that need to be decided today, if any. Truthfully, what I know, I read about in in the media. Uh, Ms. Turrican, did you have a comment on, or did you want to start with uh, Ms. Martin? I, I, my Ms. name is. Uh, yeah. Uh, Laramie Wilson. I'm a deputy clerk clerk for voter registration. Uh, Mr. Joseph Davis was intending to be a candidate, an independent candidate for the office of mayor of Bloomington. As you know, this is a two part filing for candidacy. The first part, he must collect um, signatures and the deadline for that was um, June 30th by noon. Uh, 352 signatures. That is 2% of the total votes cast for Secretary of State in the most recent general election within the city of Bloomington. Uh, Mr. Davis did uh, submit petitions starting in April, all the way up to the very deadline, June 30th at noon the number of signatures he needed was 352. Mr. Davis, um, we verified his signatures through a um, module in the Indiana State Voter Registration System to verify that the voters were registered voters at the address that they put on their petition that their name reasonably matched and their signature was a match, not needing to be a perfect match, but a reasonable match. And we came up with the verified signatures for Mr. Davis as a total of 338 uh, verified signatures. And this leaves him short, 14 signatures so the next phase of his filing that would have been a candidacy filing on July 17th, he would not be able to file this. This would be a rejected filing because he does not have enough signatures. Mr. Davis has filed this CAN-1 challenge, which the board has in their possession. Uh, with um, to challenge the verification of his signatures. And basically he laid out his uh, position in the addendum of his CAN-1 challenge form that he believes that um, there were a number of voter registrations which Mr. Davis uh, helped register a number of voters but at the time when we verified his petitions, they were not yet approved voter registrations. The way that voter registrations are processed when our um, 
voter registration clerks approve the res registration. A voter registration acknowledgement card is mailed to the voter that day that puts the voter's registration in a pending status. This is part of the state law. They stay in pending status for seven days. Then on the eighth day, if that card postcard is not returned to us as undeliverable, they become an active registered voter. So um, our instructions from the state is as we verify the petition signatures, those uh, persons who are in pending status are not to be counted as a registered voter because they are not actually effectively registered until that pending status completes. Uh, Mr. Davis's um, candidacy challenge form is on the basis of that he believes if those uh, pending statuses were allowed to play out their pending period, they would become active before the July 17th deadline to file his next thing, that he believes um, that a substantial number of those re rejected signatures would prove valid. I'm quoting from his form, potentially qualifying me as a candidate for the fall election. So. Ms. Wilson, do you happen to know the total number of, of signatures he collected, whether or not they were valid? He um, collected a little bit under 600 signatures total. A, a number of them were um, not verifiable because they were either not a registered voter, not registered it within the city of Bloomington, or did not give us the correct address where they were registered at. Um, I do not have a number of how many might have been impending at the time. Uh, it is, as he says, potentially there may be. There Thank may you. Be some. Okay, I, I have a few questions. Uh, hopefully staff or uh, and uh, Ms. Turner King, you can help with here. Um, my understanding from election division that there's, there's really no mechanism for you to go back and verify or review or, uh, the signatures. Um, that, that's not a, like a, a function of the office. So you, you verify the signatures at presentation. If they are not voters in the system, that really, that's the end of the process for our office or your office, is that correct? Okay. Correct. Um, Ms. Turner King, is that your understanding of the code too? The, the, the burden really falls on the petitioner to, to say which signatures or which voters are valid? I'm sorry, can you restate yeah, your yeah. question? Is that your, is that your understanding of code that it's really the burden is on the petitioner to say, you know, John Doe is a verified voter and he signed this piece of paper because Mr. Mr. Davis presented a statement that basically said many of my mine are correct, but without knowing which ones he's actually contesting, I don't understand the, um, the grammar of his request. And, and what, what is the burden on the office at this point? Do you, do you, for us or what, on either the petitioner or the office to verify his signatures after he filed them? Well, to take a step back, when I, in essence, what Mr. Davis has filed is counts as an appeal. And so technically, the election board would have 60 days, um, no later than noon, 60 days before the uh, date of the general election to resolve this matter. Um, it's probably ideal or significant. I, yeah, it's probably ideal to resolve it before the July 17th deadline so that if Mr. Davis could proceed to the next step of his petition or, um, to get him on the ballot, he could. Um, I don't know that I have the answer to your question today um, in regards as to whose burden it is. Um, but I, what I do know is that in looking at Indiana code, specifically IC 3868, it reads that for a petition of nomination to be considered valid by the officer required to receive the petition, so voter registration, 
the county voter registration office in the county where the petitioner is registered must certify that each petitioner is a voter at the residence address listed in the petition at the time the petition is being processed. So I spoke to the Indiana Election Division specifically about this code to determine if a voter in pending status would be considered a voter at the time the petition is being processed. And the answer I received was no, and I was directed to look at um, specifically the IC code that governs voter registration and how the seven day waiting period is, a seven, is mandatory by statute. That was a lot. Do you have any questions on? Well, because because the 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 addendum to his challenge is that he, this the suggestion that if if the signatures were evaluated again by the July seventeenth deadline when he files a can forty five, which is the consent of an independent or minor political party candidate nominated by a petition for city or town office, that those voters would have been in the system by then and therefore. V registered voters, but, but but as we just heard, as I just heard it, I believe that that's that's not a standard. <laughs> but the standard is that the voter is a, in the system is a registered voter at filing at voter registration when you when you, when you submit those signatures. Is that right? Yes. So for the signatures to count, they have to be registered voters at the time the petition is being processed. I have a question. Um, if the voter was not, uh, you know, did not qualify in April when it, his first application was processed, but then when he submitted another, another petition, I, did did you go back and look at at those names again, or was it just assumed that that voter in April that didn't qualify does not qualify until the June thirtieth date? Do, d does that make sense? my question we d we did not we um, processed them as time allowed as he brought them in his first petitions he did bring in in April in May uh, and and uh, he knew at that time he was bringing in registrations at the same time uh, compounding this there is also a voter registration shutdown window that um, ends uh, voter registration 30 day, a voter has to live in their precinct 30 days before the election. So on the 29th day, April 3rd, voter registration closes before an election and did not open up again until May 16th. So um, we did explain that to Mr. Davis and he chose to submit his um, petitions anyway the early ones, and we uh, processed them at the time, and we did not, late, once, once we verified the number of signatures that were effective in, for that April and May batch, we did not go back and recheck them. And then his later signatures he brought in during the final week, um, starting, I think, Monday, June 26th, all the way up till June 30th in several batches. He also brought in voter registrations at that time that would um, no possible way come out of pending because of the seven day deadline of pen pending status. And uh, we went ahead and uh, verified his petitions as they came in and let him know that on June 30th and we did not ever go back to reevaluate them based on who might be an active voter at a later time. Our instructions are they need to be an active voter at the time that we process, process the petitions. And there is a considerable window. Um, a, a candidate may start bringing in voter registrations on January 4th all the way up to that June 30th deadline. So Ms. Wilkinson, circling back to when you said we did not go back and revisit after the initial verification, 
Um, my question is actually to Chief Deputy Martin. Do I understand from the Indiana Election Division's response to you that there is nothing in statute that compels our office to go for go back and revisit? We move forward. That is correct. I, I, I too reached out to the IED and once they're processed, they are processed. Done deal. So if you're not registered voter, not a pending voter, if you're not a registered voter at the time that we process them, then that signature does not count. And you move on. Yeah, if, we went, if we went back, there's people that have moved. Do, they, do you subtract that? And then there's people that have died. Do you take them out too? I mean, at what point do you say, this is the final, final day? So they said that once someone's impending, they are not a registered voter to account for this certification of names. In fact, she uses a separate system. It's within the SVR system, but it's separate. <clears throat> so it would only pull up registered voters. It doesn't pull up the pending because they're not considered to be in this module that she uses mm -hmm. within the system. That's the reason why she can't tell you how many of them were pending because she never saw those. Other questions? I have no other questions regarding that, but um, because of the 17th deadline, I am going to presume that we need to recess rather than adjourn and set a meeting. I took the liberty of uh, checking with the office just, just shortly before today's meeting started and um, I understand that this room at one o'clock is available Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. Yeah, um, yeah, that that seems to be my impulse too. That, um, but but I did have a question about the timeline of things. Okay, so we know July seventeen is a big day uh, for a variety of reasons, and Ms. Turner King brought up that in theory we have until sixty days prior to the election day or early voting. To resolve the appeal, you have no later than noon, 60 days before the date of the general election. Yeah, so, so that puts it sometime in September. And, and we also have ballots that we'd like to print at some point um, and review. And, and that timeline is when usually, generally. I'm having a terrible time hearing you. I'm sorry. When, yeah, let me just yell into this. Um, Thank you. I don't know what's with the day. Um, the timeline for our printing of ballots and public review of ballots is usually when I, I have to have that done in September, the first week okay. in September, because you have early voting in October. We want to resolve this as fast as possible. Agreed. It sounds like okay. So I think that I think that yeah, uh, Clerk Brown, your point uh, is we're all checking our calendars um, for next week. Um, let's all do that as we're as we're working through this agenda. But because Mr. Uh, Davis had submitted the CAN one after our public, uh, required seven days for public notice on this meeting. Uh, he wasn't aware that we were gonna have this detailed discussion today or made aware that we were going to have this discussion today. So I, I guess um, if, yeah, if we do recess and, and, and that will provide him an opportunity to appear and, and maybe further explain um, just what it is he would like us to consider, um, that strikes me as appropriate. Um, I would agree with that. I would, might I suggest, um, because we're going to have to get him some type of notification um, that we work back from the date that it would be reasonable for him to receive it. Um, so you don't want him to receive it on the 17th, that's the day of the deadline. What date would we want him to be notified because now we're talking personal service. Actually, if I may, the, for this type of hearing, there is no administrative rules to follow like in comparison to the previous election board hearing with Mr. Bender. Um, if the board would like to hear from Mr. Davis, they can elect to do so, and I think that's probably the most fairest way to go about it. Um, but you're not required to hear from Mr. Davis because this is slightly different hearing um, than the previous hearing. Well, this isn't even a hearing. This is just, uh, yeah, I, because I, 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 that would be a remedy, right? That there's a hearing involved with the CAN 1. This is just a recess of this meeting to, to allow him to make comment. Because I, I don't think we can even make a, a full hearing off of what is here. Um, 
I have a I have a can one and a yeah. You know, there's no there's no finite number or names to check or or what's it's just many uh, and I. And apparently, there's up to 600 signatures that, are, that, that he could be talking about, or he could be talking about the 15 that he needs to clear the threshold. I, 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 but I don't have that here. I, we just, I just need more clarification from the petitioner. Right. That's all. And I concur with you. What does he want the board to do yeah. when the procedure has been done in accordance with the right. rules set forth by the Indiana Election Division? what more does he want us to do? And he's the only person who can articulate that. I will volunteer if someone else will compose the invitation. Um, I will volunteer to courier it direct to personally to him. Uh, is that something that uh, staff can handle, at least the drafting of the, the, the letter to be handed to him? <laughs> I would rather that the election board wrote the letter okay. and the clerk curry it. Okay. Now we, we, yeah, I, I will take, I will draft something that can be handed off. Okay. I have one yeah. question yeah. still from for the staff. What, how long does it take to check 600 signatures, do you think? If you were to go back and redo them all as if they were just filed, uh, you know, they all came in at the end. Do you know what I'm saying? So that you would, look at every single signature again and make sure that there's not passed away, they haven't moved, and that they're a valid voter. Does that take a lot of time or is that something you could do so that we're looking at all of those signatures prior to June 30th, which is the date that all of those signatures were supposed to be submitted? Okay, um, let me just preface her statement by saying this, under IC 3613-8A12, as amended in 2023, the County Election Board does not have the authority to order or use the procedure, which is to go back, to process candidate petitions. And it's in your packet. Yeah, so, so this comes back to, I don't know what the remedy that he's seeking is, right? Um, but I, but I appreciate the question of just how long it took you to just So hold on, we'll, look at, and we'll answer that yeah, question. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Three days. That's checking a handwritten signature off a clipboard. Well, you have to be able right. to read it, and you know people's right. writing is atrocious, so then you have to do a lot of, uh, maybe this is his date of birth, maybe yeah. that is. Yeah. So, so I, again, I think I think the recess to just have the petitioner further explain what the petition is and what's being asked of us uh, uh, that we can do under code is really the, the question. Um, um, I appreciate that. Um, would would and we will have public comment. I don't want to, when, when we start saying the next time we meet. Sometimes people think the meeting's over. I just want to make sure that. We got this. So um, it, would a week from today uh, at one o'clock be uh, fine for this board to recess too? Do you have availability? I have availability. <laughs> I have availability each of the days that the room is available, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I can be here for a one o'clock meeting. Um, so, so as you look at your calendars, just know that you don't have to worry sure, about me. As we talk about your specific request, and I'm, I think I know why you asked that question, but the implication, like if we were to go back, because three days, like, ah, that's not a lot of time, they can do it, they, you know, but the implication is, is that we did something wrong in the beginning, and that does not sit well with me. I don't think that's what I intended. I know all. you didn't. What I'm saying is if he had walked in on, on the, the 29th last day. with all of these signatures, you would have done it then. And by putting them in early, I understand the, I'm just, but it was out his choice to bring them in based on the timeline. I understand he didn't have to bring them in, but that's all I'm looking at is that had he waited to the end, we would be doing that now. It may have had different results. It may he have, may, but, he may. but I people agree. could have moved out of the county. People could have died. 
I agree. All those I factors agree. play and into. And all of that should be looked at to be, if we're going to do it, you have to look at everything. And we would have to do it for everyone. And you everyone. would have to eliminate those names who are no longer alive or no longer living at that address. And you would then add the ones that, in fact, are valid. And it may be that he really isn't going to have enough signatures. Correct. Or it may be at this time, no. I'm only looking at the fairness of it. That's all. So whether we do that or not, and whether you're willing to do that, because I understand we can't order you to do that, it would just simply be a request. And I don't know if it's possible at this point. That's all I'm asking. I feel that is a slippery slope that takes the onus off of the candidate's duty to collect the signatures, and, or to collect valid signatures. I would, I would just add, I appreciate staff's uh, always staff's work in contacting uh, election division and speaking with co-counsel to make sure that um, we're not creating precedents down here in Monroe County. So thank you all of you to uh, your, your good work to get the this part of it figured out. So it sounds like we have a few more questions up north before um, the next time we meet. Um, uh, Molly, I'm sorry, Ms. Turner King, did you have something to add? Or, or? Well, I was going to go back to the letter inviting Mr. Yeah. Davis. Um, to the next hearing or next meeting, public meeting of the election board. Um, I'm happy to adra a draft that letter if, and it would simply just say, in fact, I've done it on my computer. Um, Mr. Davis, a public meeting of the election board is scheduled for insert date. At this meeting, the election board will be discussing the filing of the CAN-1 form filed by you. The election board invites you to attend this meeting to be a part of this discussion. And if you're okay with that, you can do a roll call vote to yeah. have us me put your signatures on it. I'll print it, get it signed, and we'll send it to him or provide it to Ms. Brown to provide. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Turner King. Uh, what date do you want? Uh, the date being um, July 13, 2023 at 1 p.m. So I'll make a motion to uh, accept the language of uh, that letter. Or, wait, hold on. Does Sorry. that help him if if somehow this were to benefit him, does that help him with his July 17th deadline? Or He'd have four days to file still, um, and he'd have a chance to explain his petition so we can understand what four he's days and yeah. we, But two of those days are weekend days when we would not be open. Well, I mean, the deadline is the deadline. Um, Correct. Okay, I will second your motion. Okay, so just to be clear, uh, we're taking a motion to just accept, accept the draft letter uh, with the date July 13, 2023 at 1 p.m. Uh, where, where the board will come out of recess and consider the CAN 1. And there was a second? Yes. Okay, all those, uh, let's take a roll vote, please. Clerk Brown? Yes. Board Member Beckhart? Yes. President Henry? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Um, that, I believe, exhausts the agenda. I will now open up to public comment if there's any. And uh, TSB, yeah, looking at online as well. I can't see the chat box to know if anyone is raising a hand. Seeing no public comment in the room or in chat, I will entertain a motion to recess until July 13, 2023 at 1 p.m. I will second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. We can do voice on this, right? Yeah. Aye. Thank Aye. You. Opposed? All right, we are so recessed. See you next week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.